In this problem, we're going to take a look at the null space of a matrix. We're going to find a basis for the null space and also find the dimension of the null space. So the matrix that we're going to work with is this matrix right here, matrix A. This matrix has four rows and five columns. And like I said, the goal here is we are going to find a basis for what we call the null space of A. So that's often the notation you'll see. The null space of A is a subspace of A, and then we're going to find the dimension of the null space of A. So how big is this subspace? So here's what we want to do. First thing we want to do is we want to work on matrix A and find values of X that give us all zero solutions. So if you remember the definition of the null space is the matrix A times some vector X equals an all zero vector. And the null space consists of all those values for x such that when you multiply a times x you get an all zero vector. So it really boils down to solving systems of equations to find out what those solutions are. So let's go ahead and work on matrix A, do some row operations and get it down into reduced echelon form and then we'll be able to more easily find out what those solutions are. What values of x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5, right, because it has to be a five-dimensional vector here, give us an all-zero vector if a was to multiply that vector. So let's do some row operations. So first thing we'll do is we'll replace row 2 with row 2 plus row 1. So that's what this notation E2 equals E2 plus E1. I think of that as equation 2 plus equation 1. So rows 1, 3, and 4 are going to remain unchanged. So I filled them in here completely unchanged. But I'm going to replace row 2 with row 2 plus row 1. So if you do that, you end up with a 0 right here because a negative 3 plus 3 is 0. 1 plus 0 is 1. 3 plus a negative 2 is 1, etc. So we've gotten a 0 here, which we like. Next thing we'll do is we'll multiply equation 1, or row 1, by a third. So rows 2, 3, and 4 will all remain unchanged, but every entry in the first equation will be multiplied by a third. So I've multiplied all those by a third. Then let's go ahead and replace equation 3 with equation 3 minus 5 times equation 1. So I'm going to try to get a 0 right there. So rows 1, 2, and 4 all remain unchanged. The only thing that's changing is this equation right here. The first entry is going to be 5 minus 1 times 5, which will give us the 0 right there. The next entry will be 4 minus 5 times 0, so we'll end up with a 4, etc. So I've got a 0 there. As the next step, let's go ahead and replace row 4 with row 4 minus 7, seven times row 1, so we'll get a 0 right here. So rows 1, 2, and 3 all remain unchanged, but row 4 now looks like this. And then you'll just keep going in this fashion to get it down in re to reduced echelon form. So I'll put a few dot, dot, dots here. These are fairly straightforward steps, and I have lots of other videos that walk you through this completely. If you keep doing that, you will end up with this matrix right here, which is in row reduced echelon form. And just for the sake of notation, let's go ahead and call this matrix, matrix B. We've done all these row operations on matrix A to end up with this final reduced matrix that we'll call matrix B. And because these are all reversible row operations, we know that matrices A and B are similar to each other. They are row equivalent. That's what that kind of tilde notation means. So because of that, because they're row equivalent, whether I look at equation AX equals zero or BX equals zero, those will give me the exact same solution for the vector X. If you think about it, if I had done like an augmented matrix and put in an all zeros vector and done this, whether I had tacked it on or not tacked it on, here at the very end, you know, this equation or this system of equations is going to be exactly the same as this system of equations in terms of what solutions I get for the vector X. However, we obviously prefer the row-reduced version, B, because it's just so much simpler to work with. So let's go ahead and write that out. So here's really the system of equations that we're trying to solve. We're trying to find for what values x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, when we multiply by B, do we get an all-zero vector? That's the definition of the null space. The null space consists of all of these solutions that make this equation true. Now that I've written in row-reduced form, it's pretty easy to figure out what, what vectors 
have um, a solution to this equation. So if we look at this first row right here, we see that that row really means x1 plus 0x2 plus 1x3 plus 1x4 plus 1x5 is equal to 0. So that's this equation right here. And similarly, the second equation says that x2 plus x3 minus x4 plus 2x5 is 0. And these are the only two non-trivial equations. These other equations are just 0 equals 0. So if we rearrange this first equation and solve for x1, I have this. And if I take the second equation and solve for x2, we have this. And the reason I've written it like this is because x1 and x2 are what we call the basic variables, while x3, x4, and x5 are the free variables. So we've done this before. And the goal is to be able to write our basic variables in terms of free variables, and we've now done that. So really what we have here is the solution we're trying to find is going to be any vector of this form. x1 can take on always has the value of minus x3, minus x4, minus x5. x2 always has value minus x3 plus x4 minus 2x5. And then x3, x4, and x5 can be any value. So basically pick any values you want for these, compute what x1 and x2 have to be, and then that vector is in the null space of matrix A. So there's really an infinite collection of vectors in this null space. So, and we've done similar things like this before in previous videos. What we're going to do now is go ahead and find a basis for this infinite collection of vectors. And that's pretty easy to do now that we have our vector written down in this parameterized fashion. If I just factor out each of the free variables, I can write it like this. So I want to factor out x3, x4, and x5. So x3, there's a minus 1 here, and there is a minus 1 here, and then there are, is a 1 right there, 1x3 which is why I need a 1 right there. I had a 0 there. I just corrected that. And then there are no x3s here, and there are no x3s here, so I have a 0 and 0. Similarly, for x4, I factor out the x4. There's a negative 1 x4 here. There's a plus 1 x4 here. There's 0 and then 1, so I fill out this vector accordingly. And then finally, for x5, x5, we just look at where all the entries of x5 are, and we have this right here. So the solution for the null space can be always written like this. Tell me what x3, x4, and x5 are. I multiply them by these vectors, and that is a vector in my null space. So it's now very easy to see that every vector in the null space is some linear combination of these three vectors. So that, by definition, means that these three vectors are a basis for the null space of A. So these three vectors, which I will write down right here, and I need to correct that one entry real quick. This should be a 1 right there, so I fixed that. The final vector in the basis is negative 1, negative 2, 0, 0, 1. So that is our basis for the null space of A. Now that we have the basis, determining the dimension of the null space is trivial because the dimension of a subspace is just the number of vectors in its basis. So there are three vectors in the basis. That means this is a three-dimensional subspace. So the dimension of the null space of A is 3. So that concludes this example. We use the definition of null space to find out all vectors in the null space, and we were able to parameterize it like this in terms of these free variables. Having written, having written it like this, we see that every vector in the null space is a linear combination of these three vectors, which means that these form a basis for the null space. So we found the basis for the null space, and then the dimension of the space is just how many vectors are in the basis. In this case, it was three.